Let's see. Hopefully everybody can see that now. I wanted to say thanks to the organizers very much for this session and the conference. It was really exciting. I got to go to quite a few of the sessions and, and enjoyed it. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's a great mix of people and interesting topics and, and ambitious in a good way. So thanks again. And it's, it's fun to be a part of it. So I'm Julian, I'm, I'm an economist at the University of Exeter in the UK, and also have an affiliation with the Global Priorities Institute at Oxford, which is primarily philosophers and economists thinking about, uh, yeah, also similar issues, how to do the most good. So they, they've been mentioned a little bit, I believe, already at the conference and encourage people to look them up. So let me, let me set the stage a little bit here. Uh, and most of the time I'm gonna talk about a particular specific project that I did and some follow-on projects that came from that, but but a bit of the background and, and motivation. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss, it's, it, you can think of it as reducing ill-doing, it's antisocial behavior is, is how we conceptualized it there. Uh, and, and different successful, we were fortunate enough to have to have success at that. So that's sort of just approaching the topic. What do we know in terms of interventions, rigorously evaluated, you know, reasonable size in terms of the population size and in terms of the effect size. So we had something that works and uh, seems to work in this group so far, uh, and, and we'll go from there. But then I'll try to spend a bit of time at the end on the last slide or two, sort of stepping back and thinking about not only other versions of related to that work that others have done and that I've worked on and other people, some of which have been successful and some of which not. Some of the ones I've worked on have not been as successful. So what do, what do we learn from that? What can we take away in terms of uh, figuring out you know, are there particular groups of people or are there particular approaches? Does it depend on the facilitations type? Uh, and, and even within the setting of, of CBT, of cognitive behavioral therapy. But then it, the, the title I put on, on this talk, Knowing Thyself and Knowing Others, let's stretch that a little bit where at least our conceptualization of CBT is very much self-oriented. Now it has these positive impacts on behavior toward others. And that's the point. That's why we're talking about it here. But let's imagine an intervention that is more other oriented. Can that do a better job or is it sufficient? Is it, does it work best when it's oriented toward the self? And then you try to, to have the implications in others, or should we be thinking of that from the beginning or should it be two steps and two phases? I don't have a lot to say other than speculation there. There's a little bit of data. I'm not an expert in this literature, but I think it's worth worth raising the point here and, and just sort of bridging that that gap or, or the, the question between the, the two frames. And then also thinking in terms of, of framing, as you can see, the, the, the bullet point I have on expanding moral circle, uh, which goes back to Peter Singer has talked about it recently, but it goes back you know a lot a lot longer than that as well. Uh, so where people think of who's who's us versus them, in group and out group, and so the I, the the sense of in group has been in general expanding over time with some some backsliding as well. So across races, genders, uh, toward animal species and others, and so we could think of that a little bit as well as well if we know we behave relatively speaking fairly well toward the in-group and we maybe exclude the out-group or we have more ill-doing, more negative behavior toward out-groups, then you could you could almost take two approaches. One, take the out-group as fixed and reduce the ill-doing. Or you could say, well, let's just expand the in-group. And that's a way of effectively reducing, even if you do the same behavior toward in-group and out-group, if your in-group is bigger and your out-group is smaller, that's another way to reduce ill-doing. So try to link that in a little bit as well. Okay, so that's setting the stage. That's where we're going. That's why why I'm going to talk about this particular project and how it fits in with the scheme and hopefully with some of the other the other interesting stuff going on at the conference and, and people's research agendas. So the particular project is a paper uh, published in 2017 in the American Economic Review, and we have some some auxiliary papers as well called Reducing Crime and Violence. It took place in, in Liberia. I'll, I'll, I'll say more about the context in, in a minute in the next slide or two. So this is with Chris Blattman, who's now at the University of Chicago, and Margaret Sheridan, who's now at North Carolina. Chris is, uh, is a PhD in economics, as I am, but works more on the political science side of things. So his is the link to sort of crime and violence here, including election violence uh, and, and related areas. 
both sort of both individual and social level. Uh, I'm the a behavioral economist, uh, mostly. Uh, I think a lot about methodology uh, and that side. Both Chris and I have worked a lot in, in developing countries and in particular in Africa. Uh, and, and Margaret will say more about it in a minute. So, so there's an the interdisciplinary side there. And just to say a few words of where this came about, because I think it's a little bit interesting, is Chris had been working in Liberia already, and it's, it's a fairly difficult country uh, to work in for a number of reasons friendly people, but difficult for other reasons, structural reasons. And so he had basically access to money or he knew it would be fairly easy to get some money. And so, so we sat down, we had lunch, I believe it was together. This was 10 years ago, uh, one day. Um, and, and he said, well, I, I, there's, a, I, there's this pot of money we need to apply for, but I don't think it's gonna be too competitive if we can do something with young men in Liberia, maybe around employment. And, and I said, well, I, I've been thinking for a while about whether or not it's possible to change people's time preferences. You know, can you get people to be more patient? You know, in, in economics, traditionally, we take them as fixed, as given. Uh, it's just part of your utility function. But that doesn't seem likely to be the case, certainly not for children. But let's say for young adults, maybe more interesting. Is this a bit malleable? I don't know whether, how much that relates to employment, but probably it relates something. We can, we can come up with a proposal here. Uh, and, and I think it would be fun to work on. He thought so too. We wrote a proposal. We got some funding. We started talking to a local organization as well and the local engagement part of this is also really key that's been mentioned also a little bit earlier earlier i think on the first day of the conference and then margaret both of us knew margaret she's a clinical and developmental psychologist and we thought well we, we need a real a real psychologist here uh, to help with this and she looked at where we'd gotten so far in developing the intervention and said you know that looks a lot like cbt do you guys know about CBT? There's a big evidence base here. We know a lot about CBT. And, and we said, well, we've heard of it, but no, we didn't really think of that. And so she came in and, and it really improved it. So if you look at the paper, <laughs> if you read the paper, it looks like, oh, we started the CBT intervention, but that was actually about six months in after we'd already started and, and worked on designing it. And, but it made a real difference. It's much, much better now than, than it would have been. And so we, we appreciate that. Okay, so what did we do? So this is in Liberia. Um, that's the, the little red dot in West Africa, has historic links to the United States, there's been some back and forth there. Uh, a small country, about 4 million people, huge, long civil wars, multiple wars, different combatants for, for about 15 years. Um, and then from about 2006 onward, a fairly stable democratic government, but a very weak state. So a lot of United Nations presence, uh, a lot of foreign development and foreign aid presence. Uh, and then Ebola hit a few years later. So we're working in between those two, so sort of 2011. Uh, so about 10 years ago is, is a lot of the field work here. So that's, that's the state of the country. So what about the people? So we're gonna be working in Monrovia, which is the capital and largest city. And the hustle, which doesn't have quite the negative connotation there that it would in American English. They, so they speak a version of English, Liberian English there, but it's not, it's not quite the same. And so the hustle is just what you do to get by, how you make a living. And so we spent a lot of time at the beginning um, asking people, talking to them, what do you, what do, you do? How do you? How do you survive? How do you make a living? Um, and, and there's not a lot of formal employment opportunity. So, so it's self-employment. It's sometimes manual labor. It's, this is a market. So it's selling things in the market or transporting things around the market. And then there's a fair amount of, of petty criminality. And that's part of the population we'll, we'll work with. But they don't have access. One of the things that's important here is there's, you know, they can't go to a bank and get a loan. The, the people we're working with have been cut off because from family often, partly because of the war, uh, partly just because that's the group we're working with. So they can't get loans and connections. They don't have an uncle they can borrow money from or start a business with. Uh, there isn't microfinance that's really working with this population either. So they don't have a lot of options to, to sort of invest in the future, if you want to think of it that way, even if they wanted to. And there's this group of, so our, our intervention is going to be only with men. Um, we can come back and talk about that. We, whether it made sense to separate and start with them. Other people have done, done work with young women there. There's some different issues at play. And so, so this is a high-risk men, and, and governments are 
let's say fairly worried about this for their own sake and otherwise. So if they're if they're unemployed, if they're out there the makeshift work or they're struggling or they're unhappy, this is a group that can cause a lot of problems one way or another. Uh, and they are engaging, as I said, in, in different levels of criminality. I'll give a few statistics about our population in general in a, in a few minutes. But, but one thing to note there is that uh, for the most part, it doesn't require startup capital you know, to, to go and be a, a thief, you know, basically. So it's, it's one of the options that they have. Drug selling, drug using, uh, that's part of our population as well. Uh, and that's sort of coming in. This is not, you shouldn't think of this as some areas in, let's say, the United States or Latin America, where everything is very sophisticated. So I would say even the, the criminal operations and the gangs are not particularly sophisticated. It's not hugely violent, but it was sort of growing at that level more and more of the drug trade. And I, I sort of alluded to this a little bit already, concerns of mercenary recruitment, either the wars in Liberia or next door, there was a war going on in Cote d'Ivoire or next door on the other side, there was a war going on in Sierra Leone. So that's that's the environment we're talking about. And this is young men and they do, they spend time, they get paid to go and, and vice versa. So we would talk to people who'd, who'd been exposed to a lot of conflict and violence already, or maybe they'd been young. Uh, when the civil war started and, and was going on in Liberia. And so things had broken up. They hadn't been able to get a full education. So the, the typical response, at least from, from an economist perspective, I could say, but, but maybe also from a policy perspective, would be carrot and stick or carrot or stick, maybe together, maybe separately. So uh, policing, so you know, do what you can, although again, the state is quite weak here. And there's not a lot they can do. There's not a lot of power that they have. Uh, and jobs or some other incentive, but there are also there aren't a lot of jobs. So so partly, this is it's not super effective uh, because it doesn't exist very well. It's just difficult in the short run, at least, to attempt this. But also, it's not clear that this is exactly what's going to work. This is the traditional approach to look at external incentives, but. We had this other idea, and again, working with a local NGO who had already started doing this before we arrived on the scene, that maybe we can change a little bit more internally. So, so this is a nice, uh, and I should, a lot of these pictures come from Glenna Gordon, by the way, she's a great photographer. So give her credit on that. So Satan, you may have our past, but don't mess with our future. So this is like, we wanted to think about the future and get them to change, to try to, to be a little bit different. So can we change what are sometimes called non-cognitive skills, which is not a very good name for them, I don't think, because they're all in the brain anyway, but sort of soft skills, socio-emotional skills, psychosocial skills, they go by different names. And, and I, again, I was seeing a lot of this as time preferences and discount rates. So can we do that for, for adults, for young adults, but for adults? I won't spend too much time talking about CBT, partly because I know there are a lot of psychologists here and I'm a little bit embarrassed as an economist to be talking about it. You probably know better than I do. Uh, but the way, the way I think about it is it's really this, it's cognitive and behavioral. And so it's really this back and forth, this two-way street of practicing behaviors, thinking through what we're going to do as a group version of CBT. There's a lot of role playing. There's practicing in the real world as well. So we would give them sort of little homework assignments to go and do something, come back to the group and talk about it and process it. So that the back and forth. And, and as this huge evidence base, it's, it's, it's sort of very rigorously tested, but for the most part in, in the global north and developed countries, especially the US, and for the most part for, for clinical diagnoses, so for phobias and PTSD, not so much sort of generically for people who are, who are in trouble and might need a little bit of help. So again, try, I won't go through too much details in the paper. I'm happy to talk about it, but this was group-based. It was eight weeks. They're meeting three times a week for several hours a day in their group. Uh, the, the facilitators, the counselors were not trained social workers or psychologists, which doesn't exist in Liberia. I think there's maybe one psychiatrist and one psychologist in Liberia in the entire country when we were there. Uh, but they were, they're very well selected. So they're often from the streets themselves, but they've done well so they can, they can talk the talk, but they're really, they were really great. They're really fantastic. And, and so we worked with them. They had a program they'd started. We sort of tweaked and adapted it and modified it and focused it a little bit. Okay, so roughly speaking, two parts to the, to the program, the version that we implemented, one around self-control, so planning, thinking about the future, here's where the time preferences come in, who do you want to be in five years' time, how will you get there, talk through the plan, make it really concrete and detailed, not just I want to be a successful entrepreneur, but what am I going to do next to make that happen? And then, and then reducing the sort of automaticity and, and automatic behaviors, especially anger. And so this is where we're going to get especially close to the antisocial behavior and the ill-doing. But it's a little bit more 
self-focused. So it might be to reduce confrontations, but it's not really negotiation skills at this point. And it was one of the things we wanted to train, change about the program that the, the pre-existing version was to really make it, what, what do you have to do differently? And then maybe step two is how do you deal with others? And it has implications for that, but this is, I'll come back to again, at, at hopefully a time at the very end to say, this is the self-focused version. What would an other focused version of this might look like? What can we learn? And then second, changing the self-image. We, we, we have a whole sort of theory appendix, a model in the paper. Uh, think about it as changing values. But here was really, a lot of it was physical image. So this is a, a picture of a guy getting a haircut. They might have sort of a ripped, dirty t-shirt and they would go get a new, even if it's a new used t-shirt or they were um, going around barefoot and, and we'd get flip-flops or sandals for them or encourage them to or, or pay a small amount of money. So just really think of themselves as members of society uh, rather than on the periphery, on the margin, which is which is really where they were before. Sometimes they even took two new names. They would have maybe their war name, their conflict name from the Civil War. We would encourage them to change their peer group, not hang out with a group from the war, but a new group of people. Because again, they, a lot of these this, these guys have lost their family connections for the most part. Okay, so, so who's the group? Um, in their 20s, uh, some schooling, they're not the poorest of the poor, so they've got a primary education, they're making about $2 a day, which is more than the less than $1 a day that, that the poorest are making. Uh, and just if you look at the last line there, uh, committed a theft in the past two weeks, 53% say, yes, I've committed a theft in the past two weeks at, at, at baseline. So we have two interventions. We give $200 cash, that's it, unconditional. 200 US, this is a, quite a bit of money for them. So do what you want with it. And, and then one group gets this CBT, one group gets both, first the CBT and then the cash right after, and there's a control group, pure control group that gets neither. This is about a thousand, thousand people total. It costs about 500 to do the, everything together, the group that got both. So first result, what do they spend the money on, those who get the cash? Turns out they don't really waste it. They try to do things with it, even the non-CBT group. So even the non-therapy groups, I won't go through all the lines here. The takeaway is that they do reasonable things. They don't waste on drugs. They try to get an education or learn a skill or start a small business. And, and it's fairly similar with or without the therapy. And then here, this is, I won't give you sort of the formal statistical results. So this is kind of the, the main results uh, for, for a couple, but I promise I'm not, I'm not self-selecting here. We, we, we put them all together in an index and this is what we find overall. So look on, on the left side, roughly. So we've got short term, that's about one month. Long term, that's about one year. I'll get back to that. And this is, for instance, thefts and robberies in the past two weeks. The dark blue uh, bar on the left is the control group. And then we have the three different treatment arms, therapy only, cash only, and the two combined. Everything gets better in the short run. So this is interesting, not obvious. So even if you give people just cash, they sort of revert a little bit. They say, all right, well, maybe they don't need to rob anymore, but even some of the other antisocial behaviors, sort of violence and, and interpersonal violence goes down. So they sort of, they try, they, they make an effort. We've got this money, they're gonna do something. This is a really big, you know, they're not gonna, nobody's gonna give them $200 again. So this is like their chance to do something with themselves in the world. And they try, all of them, all of the ones in the treatment arms. But the only one that lasts for a year is, is the therapy plus cash, the combined arm. The others go back up, basically go back up to normal. And it's the same for the economic outcomes. If you look at homelessness or income, basically same idea. Therapy doesn't do too much in the short run there, but both of the cash arms make things better. But the only one that's sustained is the combined with therapy. So it, the therapy matters, even if it's not having this direct effect in the short run. So, so why, why the combination? You know, we can't, we can't prove this. We did some qualitative work. We talked to them. We have a couple of theories. But it seemed like it's, it gives them a chance to, to try longer, to keep going. Uh, so so the, the cash sort of extends the effect of the therapy. It's one thing to be, to be told, you know, here's, here's a way to improve. You, you, you're really excited. You want to do it. But if you're back on the hustle, back on the streets, and you don't have this economic possibility of changing your behavior that doesn't do things, if you can practice it even for a few months, cash lasts that long, it's enough to, to then be sustained at least for a year. And, and maybe just you know, doing it, you feel better about yourself at that point. It's, 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 you've got the money in your pocket, you've got the new shirt, and you've got this new outlook on life. So that's our idea, but the, the results are the results. Okay, so 
starting to step back a little bit. I know I'm, I had I think a few minutes, but not, not very long now. So there was a very similar program, totally independently done in high schools in inner city Chicago at the same time. Um, and so it's published Heller et al. actually in the same year. Uh, they, but these, both of these were sort of multi-year projects that happened to, to occur at the same time independently and also very successful with these. Um, so younger, but keeping them in school, keeping them um, out of jail. So there's been success of, of, of those two papers, at least in the economics literature and the policy uh, and the, the development literature. So now there've been a lot of papers on a lot of projects written on this. I've been involved in, in several of them with, with students, with secondary students in particular in Mexico and South Africa. I've worked with entrepreneurs in Pakistan. Chris and, and others have worked with gangs in Latin America. He does a lot of work in Colombia and other people have taken it as well and, and run with it, which is great. Um, so, so and then not all of those have showed success. Not all of those have results yet. It hasn't always worked, but there's been this sort of idea, let's go and try this with different, again, non-clinical populations. So that's why I say pseudo CBT. Uh, I've heard some psychologists say quite rightly, you know, this isn't formally CBT. Maybe we should give it a different name, but it has, has some of the same driving factors behind it. And it's not cheap. It's not like a nudge uh, in, in the choice architecture sense, but it's relatively inexpensive and it has these these potentially sustained really important impacts. So we're actually going, we're in the field now, we're almost done tracking these same guys. 10 years later, we found 95% of them so far, although, well, I say found about 10% of them are dead uh, by now, but we've tracked them down. We found them, some of them are in jail. We're surveying them. I, I, it, we have preliminary results and I can't say them anyway, but I'll just to say it's, it's not all noise. There's some intriguing, intriguing things to, to, to see. Um, okay, so, so the last, last couple of bullet points, this is it, the last slide. We, we couldn't, of course, force people to participate, but about two thirds of the people we approached participated and then were randomized into the different groups. So a lot of them want to change and a lot of them can change. We find these sustained results with a little bit of help, you know, with the support program in particular with this, this version of C CBT and non-trivially, not just on the margin. You know, it really makes a difference. You know, these numbers come down not by 5%, but by 20, 25%, something like that. So I can't claim this is a necessary first step if we're trying to reduce ill doing toward others, but it certainly worked. So we had this program that was focused on the self and it did reduce this behavior toward others in this case. And it seems like I would say a fairly good thing to do anyway. It's, it's nice to have this self-focused version. And then maybe that means if we're thinking about interventions that are more targeted toward others and, and reducing, let's say, ill doing, that something similar of something like CBT, and I'm really speculating, if it's reflection, deliberation, knowledge, not just about yourself, but about others and other groups. And so extent reducing out group bias, uh, this, there's this idea of exclusivist morality in this paper I cite from the philosophy literature, the practical philosophy literature, expanding moral circles, Peter Singer and others have talked about. So maybe this idea of understanding yourself, understanding others, talk to them, back and forth between cognition and behavior. I'd be curious to try it. So that's it. Thanks for the attention. Thanks for your time. And I'm curious for any, probably not questions now, but discussion at some point on the rest of the talks. Great. Thank you so much for that really interesting presentation about this work. So, um, we have about five minutes for questions. So if you want to ask a question, um, you can raise your hand virtually. Um, and then I'll also check out if people made any questions in the Google Doc. Okay, I see a question from David Weinstein. Um, Hi, uh, Julian, thanks a lot for your uh, talk. I really liked it. Um, I just asked a bunch of questions in the Google Doc. Um, and I guess maybe just it's mostly like clarifications, but was, for instance, was the, was, were the promised um, money, was that known to them when they were doing the CBT? Uh, was the CBT combined, always combined with the image boosting treatments? Um, and yeah, did, what kind of different attrition did you have? I guess I'm sort of, you know, wondering what, uh, what, could have been behind the success of the CBT with money in, in, in asking these questions. Yeah, thanks. And, and hi again, David. Uh, I'll, I'll go look at the Google Docs. They knew when they were going through the CBT, they knew there was a chance of money. When we first recruited people, we didn't tell them you might get $200. Um, maybe would have had higher take up at that point, but we just asked, 
you know, anyway, do you want to be a part of this program? Are you willing to invest some time? When they actually got started, they knew there was a chance of the money, but they didn't know whether they were in the cash group or not. That was done physical randomization right at the time. This was after the after the CBT. Oh, uh, and, So it and, couldn't have been that this, that they engaged more because they were expecting cash, whereas the other group did. No, also. no, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have wanted wanted that for exactly the the reasons you're no. saying. Um, the the image was part of the CBT, so that was part of what we thought of there. So it was there was just one version of the of the CBT program. Okay, so you don't know that it was precisely the CBT and not the image. Okay, yeah, well, that's that and that's what I'm saying is for us that was that was part of that's it's not it's not formally CBT perhaps, but it was all we thought they were similar enough that it made sense. But uh, and this is a, a broader uh, we got this. Uh, you were you were saying it very politely, but we got this criticism. It's a bit kitchen sink. There's a lot in the, in the, the therapy intervention, that's for sure, and we can't separate them out too much. I mean, we can do some who came to which sessions and what happened, but it's it's not going to be causal. It's not going to be experimental at that yeah. point. Okay, thanks for the call. Right, great. So then, um, seems that Mikael has a question as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for an exciting um, uh, talk here and uh, intriguing. I wonder, um, let's see, uh, in, in uh, Liberia, the conditions under which these uh, young men uh, was uh, are, are living, was it that uh, uh, their criminality, their crime, their ill-doing uh, had short-term benefits but would have a long-term cost for them? Or... or uh, could it actually be, I'm a sociologist, I'm thinking, isn't it socially rational in a tough society like that, that young men in the margin who don't have any, may not see or even have any uh, true ways of, of being part of established society and have a family and job and so on to, to go into uh, criminality. So, uh, whereas I... Yeah, so that was one question. And another question is, how do you know that uh, their answers, uh, that, yeah, that they are accurate and correct and that they're, they're not making things up? Yep. Yes, um, uh, great, great questions. I, I think you, I would probably agree with you. I think it's probably fairly rational for the first question. I, I can't say there would be necessarily long-term consequences, negative consequences. They really didn't have a lot of opportunities. Otherwise, um, it, one of the, there are a lot of great, what I think are great phrases in Liberia and English, but one of them is if you if somebody leaves their mobile phone behind and you take it, that's correcting someone's mistake. So that's the phrase. So we use that as one of our survey questions. You know, have you been correcting someone's mistake recently? Like have you just been picking things up side? So so you know it's 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 a hard environment and they didn't necessarily see that as you know hurting other people. I don't know some of it was pretty clear. Um, but you know some of the drug use not so so I, I think that's right and that also maybe changes our interpretation a little bit of, of I mean this this we call it antisocial behavior I think that's fair I think it is this is not socially beneficial uh, but it's a little bit different than an environment where there's sort of clearly bad for them bad for everyone and, and going to be a Pareto improvement for the second one absolutely we we did a lot of work uh, we wrote a whole second paper actually on methodology we we had this sort of anyway so uh, we can't can't prove it, but um, but yes, I'm I'm fairly convinced it's it's real. We're worried about that. We we did about four different things to try to test for it. We spent a lot of time on it, and and hopefully it's real. But great question, yeah. Thank you.